Hello and welcome to PBCJ Presents, our weekly discussion series in which we examine some of the hot button issues of the day. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. This week, our focus is drug abuse. Drug abuse is the act of using legal or illegal substances in ways you shouldn't. You might take more than the regular dose of pills or use someone else's prescription. People sometimes abuse drugs like marijuana or methylene dioxy, methamphetamine, MDMA, to feel good, ease stress, or avoid reality. Abuse can lead to addiction. Addiction is when you can't stop. With us in studio today to talk about this social issue is Uki Atkinson, Research Analyst at the National Council on Drug Abuse, the NCDA. Welcome, Ms. Atkinson. Thank you very much for having me. All right, first off, what is the role of the NCDA? So the National Council on Drug Abuse is the agency mandated as the uh, state agency to respond to drug demand reduction. Drug demand reduction, first of all, the agency has been around since 1983. So we're almost 40 years old. And we undertake a, a range of services which include research on the extent of drug use in the island. What are we using? What, you know, what's the pattern of use? What kind of drugs? Who is using them? So we do several studies on different segments of the population. We also conduct prevention, drug prevention programs as well as treatment. So there are counseling programs. We do capacity building among partners to be able to help persons to understand more about this substance use issue. And we also have a, a wide range of partnerships which are local, regional, and international to look at a, a greater, broader response to the drug, the, the drug problem. Good. Now, there's a report that says your organization has impacted 100,000 adults and just about 4,000 children through its in-school prevention program. Tell us about that. Right. So prevention programs, I should have also said public education is a major thing that we do. And in-school prevention is at various levels. So it is a scientific undertaking where you approach the population at what is called the universal level, where you give messages, prevention messages, um, pro-healthy lifestyle messages to an entire group of children or adolescents. You have what is called selective prevention, where you know that there's a certain subset of children who are at risk for being substance users. And this being at risk could be by virtue of where they live, of their academic uh, performance of the things that they're exposed to so it's a wide range of risk factors and these children are pulled out and and programs which aim not only to give them knowledge but also to give them skills to be able to cope better with life because what we know is a number of persons turn to substance use because they're unable to cope with issues that they face so in addition to that we have indicated prevention indicated prevention is where we know that these young people are already using, and you do more specialized, individualized, small group uh, activities with them in order to help them to, or to prevent them from moving on to more, more habitual use. So one of those programs, I take it, is a Take It To Them program. Tell us about that. Take It To Them is actually a separate program. That's what is called harm reduction. Now, harm reduction is an approach where you know that people are using substances. They may also be dependent on these substances, but you are helping them to use it, not helping them to use it. You are helping them to recognize safer ways of continuing their use because really what they have already declared is that they do not intend to stop. And so you do a number of, of um, initiatives and activities with them to help them to use in a, in, a, in a safer way. So we have, Take It To Them is among homeless drug users. Um, so persons who are commercial sex workers, men who have sex with men, just, you know, the homeless population is the target of that. And there is both drug prevention and HIV prevention in that program. So an addict can come to the organization and seek help then? Absolutely. And, and one of the things that 
in, in, in today's world, we try to stay far from words like addict because those are words that kind of socially label people. So, you know, you, we use these words in our, in our context. Oh, him is a cokehead. Oh, she's a druggie. You know, those are kind of words that we, we try to, to, to steer people away from because it is unduly labeling people in a way that they'll feel socially excluded. So you don't label them? We try not to. I mean, it, it's, it's, we, we're growing into, you know, the more politically correct way to refer to people. All right. So what's the response been like over the years? Well, you can talk about recently um, to the programs that you have been um, implementing. Okay. So I can say that a major thrust of the council is in the education system. And the response from our leaders in the system has been phenomenal. NCDA has been in probably almost all schools across the island with some form of program or the other. And so there is that welcoming and, you know, serious recognition that this issue of drug prevention doesn't only, you know, it, it's something that is far reaching. It's something that is necessary. So I have to say at the leadership level, at the community level as well, we have a number of partners in our communities at the workplace level, you know, the, the response has been very good thus far. But there are reports, though, of increased usage for certain drugs. So would you say that Jamaica has a drug problem? We have to be very careful about statements that we make about drug use. The fact is, in every single society, there is a subset of persons who will use substances. There are different levels of substance use. So there are those who will use it in a harmful way. There are those, those who will use it recreationally. The problem part of it is where it becomes an addiction and, 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 and harmful use. 16% of our population has been um, identified as harmful alcohol users. Alcohol is a drug that is most widely used in Jamaica. Does Jamaica have a drug problem? Certainly we know that the issue of drug use is related to other issues. So it is related to, among youth, you know, um, engaging in risky behaviors. That's a problem. With the criminal system, criminal justice system, drug use is also related to the, you know, the act of committing crimes, whether it be under the influence or in order to you know, get whatever it is that you need to fuel your drug use habit or there is a criminal organized crime network. So that's also a problem. So just to label and say Jamaica has a drug problem will make people think everybody in Jamaica using drugs, you know, and we, you know we, we don't want to sensationalize it that way, mm -hmm. but certainly we do know that there are aspects of our reality that are concerning and require urgent attention. All right, I have to stop you there. For now, we're going to go to our first break. You're watching PBCJ Presents, and we're talking about drug abuse. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to PBCJ Presents. We're talking about drug abuse and we have with us in studio Miss Atkinson. Now, some are of the view that the decriminalization of marijuana has been misunderstood. Uh, they act as if it has been fully legalized and since it's a herb, it's okay for young people to smoke it. Give your opinion on this view. Okay, so first of all, we know that the act of decriminalization was done in order to, let's say, declog the criminal justice system. Um, internationally, these have been legislative framework shifts that have been occurring across the world. We also know that in some countries, the impact of decriminalization and legalization has not necessarily been an increase in use in cannabis, but an increase in the intensity of use. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So okay. for those people who were already using, it has been found in some studies 
that there has been an, a greater intensity of use. What so did we find here? So if you used to do here? one spliff a day, no, you may be using you, more. It, right. That mean, is what oh, has been okay. found in you some jurisdictions. The, oh, okay. Yes. But we can't message. speak specifically to increases in prevalence because we have not yet done another um, general population survey. That's to come next year, early next year. What we will say, however, is that we do know that the perception of risk, so how risky do you think it is to use ganja? How risky do you think it is to use it on a frequent basis, that sort of thing? We know that among our youth, that was affected because this, the, the greater sentiment among them. There's, a conf, there's confusion about the value of ganja. Value meaning, okay, now that it's decriminalized, it means that it must be good. Or the fact that it, it has medicinal properties, which is a fact, it means when I smoke it, it must give me medicine. So there is a misunderstanding about the value of ganja and the potential danger, especially among our youth. What we, in, what we aim to do, and we continuously aim to do at the council, is to increase what is called you know, the IQ about ganja. So how dangerous is it? So the fact is that there are some people who are predisposed to mental illness. So if you have mental health um, challenges in your family, if you use ganja, it can increase the likelihood that you will have negative effects, right? Um, and another thing is that youth in particular are at increased risk for uh, adverse effects. So what we know is that the brain is developing during the adolescent period. When you introduce substances to a growing brain, which doesn't finish de developing until our mid-20s, what that can do is have serious effects on the way that young people are able to, to perform academically, their behavior, the risks they will take. We're not saying that every young person who smokes ganja is going to become you know, dependent and habitually use it. But what our studies have found is that one in five who use it are at risk for misusing it. Another thing we've found is that their perception of risk has changed over time. So that the whole thing of edibles which they have said is more common now, you know, it's one of the popular things that our young people um, say they use now. They feel that eating ganja is not as, as dangerous or as risky or as bad as smoking it. But the truth is, a number of young people have told us of the acute effects that they've gotten after, you know, they take edibles, they carry it to school. Here's the risk. If you and I decide, okay, we're going to make some ganja cookies, you can put two grams of ganja in it. I can put 200 grams. So there is no, there, there's just a whole wide range of circumstances that can impact that young person, including the amount of it that they eat. Because it's sweet, generally what they do, they eat it and they expect a, a, a reaction very quickly. But it takes time for ganja to be um, absorbed by the system so when they eat, we eat it. They eat so some they more. Eat more and they eat more and a number of them have told us of hospitalizations and so on. I've seen in the news where they're saying there's an increased amount of edibles being found in school. Overall though, is there evidence that drug abuse has increased in schools? We can't say that because we have not done a recent secondary school survey, uh, but we can say that Referrals have increased. We can say that um, confiscation of paraphernalia, so you know the vape devices and finding children at the back of the school, all of those things in terms of referrals to the council have increased. So based on those circumstances, and we know that on the heels of COVID-19, our children are going through a whole lot. Our adolescents, even adults, Right? The calls to the council have significantly increased in recent years. And so we know that people are struggling and we know that there is a likelihood that people who are already using perhaps have increased use, but we would have to have the raw data, the actual data, to be able to say there is an, there is an increase. And we don't, we don't make statements like that True. Um, you know, so, so without knowing. We stand by for more data on that aspect. Let's go on to another drug that seems, based on reports, to have become more popular in schools, and that is the molly, right? The MDMA. Yes. You deem the use of molly 
you mean the NCDA, NCDA as a security threat now, a public security threat. But it's been here for years. Why are you saying it's a threat? So here is the thing. What we know is that prior to the mid-2022, mid our engagement with students has never yielded as much information about MDMA, about Mali use, about the popularity of it. They were able to tell us. We did focus group discussions across the island in May. And our students across the island were able to articulate what Mali looks like, how to get it, what it does to people, what they see people doing it, their friends who use it. I mean, they, they, the knowledge was so in-depth that it indicates that it is definitely much more popular, made even more popular by some of the content that they're exposed to through music, through social media, through their own friends. And so with that said, in addition, to the fact that we've gotten calls about people who have been sexually assaulted, unknowingly drugged by Mali, um, this has, has led us to rec recognize that, yes, there's a public health part of this where, you know, you want to keep your population safe, you want to keep the population um, away from substances that impact their behavior and their health and all of that. But then there's also a public security issue because if people are being sexually assaulted, then there is need for us to come down even further on this, this reality. All right. For those of us who do not know, Molly or MDMA is a synthetic mind-altering drug with hallucinogenic effects. They say it's packaged in attractive ways to attract youngsters. What have you found in your observations and reports in terms of what it looks like? Because I want the parents and other persons and even students who are in areas to be able to identify that. When we come back from the break, I want you to answer that question. You're watching PBCJ Presents and we're talking about drug abuse we're getting into the meat of the matter the most recent drug problem we have and that is the use of molly especially with our school students stay with us we'll be right back Welcome back to PBCJ Presents. We're talking about drug abuse. So at first, you may choose to take a drug because you like the way it makes you feel. You may think you can control how much and how often you use it. But over time, drugs can change how your brain works. These physical changes can last a long time. They make you lose control and they can lead to damaging behaviors. Before we went on the break, we were talking about the use of Molly. And I was asking Ms. Atkinson about what her team has found in their observation in terms of how it is presented. Because sometimes these drugs are presented in such an attractive way that they seem harmless. Yes, and that's definitely true. Because what, I mean, what we know of this, this drug is that it comes in different shapes, different sizes, different colors. Um, the adolescents across the island were telling us there some of them are blue, some of them are red. The blue one is for the girls, the red one is for the, the boys. So it, there is no one pill that you can look at and say, ah, oh, that is Molly. So that's, therein lies a danger as well. What are some of the side effects of taking this drug? Okay, so first of all, it's typically a, a party drug. And what we know is that in our setting now, there are actually Molly parties that are, that are taking place. There are parties that are taking place that you have to take a Molly pill before you can go in. There are all-inclusive parties where you pay a fee, just like before where you'd pay and you get alcohol all night, you can get Molly all night. It typically creates a feeling of euphoria. It can cause hallucin hallucinations. It speeds up the heart, right? So it is, it is a stimulant. And it, it can cause increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. It can cause excessive sweating. It can cause people to have muscle tension, you know, teeth clenching and all of that. And it can also cause an increased desire for sexual activity. And therein lies the problem. Because there are young people and young adults 
who are using it as a method to be able to get into sexual activity with others who don't even know that Molly is going into their drink. How can parents know if their child is abusing a drug, especially okay. Molly? So Molly and all other substances, let's, let's just look at parenting um, vigilance, right? What we, what we tell parents is when you see significant changes in a pattern of behavior, that's always a red flag. There's a reason why a child who is typically, you know, sociable and happy and if that child all of a sudden becomes increasingly aggressive or they become reclusive, they don't want to talk to anybody anymore, or their grades start declining, or they stop taking care of their personal hygiene, or they're, they're with different people. They're not with the typical friends that you know that they're with. One of the things that we also tell parents is to try to keep the lines of communication open. So you don't only want to say to your child, stop using drugs, you know, don't make sure you don't use it. Or if you use ganja, you're going mad, you know, or if you use alcohol, you're going to mash up your liver. No, we want you to be able to have open conversations with your child, have them feel comfortable enough to be able to come to you and explain to you some of the things that they're going through. There are young people as young as 13 and 14 and 15 who have called our council and the family members have called to say that it's their friends who have exposed them to this molly drug and other, other substances as well. It is because of the company that they keep and they didn't know that they said. If parents are participating more in their, in their children's lives, they would be more aware and more attuned to changes that occur over time. Right, because it gives a high, right? So if I see my child go out and then come home and the child is sleeping all day, well into the next day or something like yes. that, then you, you, you want That's to, you want to check. Flag. Because if it speeds up my heart, then it's going to probably, I'm guessing, slow down. Yes, there is eventually. a low. There is a significant low that comes after and the And that high. would affect schoolwork. Yes. And there has been an account of a young lady who, you know, the family recognized her behavior was just erratic. She was aggressive, then she was happy, then she was loving everybody, then she was upset with everybody. And they had to, you know, investigate further. And what, when they found out, the entire peer group, all of them were using Molly, which was given to them by people who were older than they are. All right, so we have a problem. Yes. So the government is planning to upgrade the laws. What, what conversation have you been having? Because I'm expecting that they would be talking to your organization in terms of how to combat this issue. Absolutely. So there are a number of strategies that have been developed, uh, not only for the security side of things, but also in the education system to be able to revise the policy on drug use in schools so that it would be more um, appropriate for our time now, right? Uh, there are things like capacity building among school personnel, there's a public education program being planned and a more sustained one so that you don't just come out with messages during a particular month or on a particular day, but it's something that we have as a long-term um, impact or effect. Uh, there's also the, the, the commitment to be able to look at our legislative framework, particularly for drugs like Mali and newer drugs that are coming up across the world, right? Uh, to be able to tighten the framework so that some of these substances are under the Dangerous Drugs Act instead of under, you know, other acts like Chemical Precursors Act and, and, and Pharmacy Act and so on. So that when we find people who are trafficking these drugs or supplying children with these drugs, there can be more stringent methods applied. How do we contact the NCDA? What if I'm a parent or, you know, a guardian or a sister or a peer, a yes. student? Yes. How do we contact you to get help? Okay, so we have a, we have a helpline. There's a helpline, 876-564-4357. There's our main line, 929-600-224. And we also have officers in every parish. So it doesn't mean that you have to come to Kingston if you are in St. James or if you are in Hanover or, you know, Clarendon. We have officers who are able to respond. All right. If you are someone who is abusing drugs, there is help, as you've heard. The earlier you can get treatment for drug addiction, the more likely you are to avoid some of the more dire consequences of this disease. 
You've been watching PBCJ Presents, our topic this week, drug abuse. Thanks to my special guest, Ms. Yuki Atkinson, research analyst at the National Council on Drug Abuse. This has been PBCJ Presents. Thanks for watching.